Welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking the time in order to join us for another Fit Nation Lunch and Learn. Uh, joining us this time is John Briggs. John Briggs is the founder of Insight Tax and Accounting, author of Profit First for Micro Gyms. And his accounting firm has more, more gym clients than any other in, in the country. Uh, and he's also the owner of a gym, a gym called GSL Fitness. So we're really blessed in order to be able to have John joining us today. John, thanks, thanks for taking the time to join us. Yeah, Kalen, thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat with you today. Yeah, same here. And, and maybe to kind of kick things off, if you wouldn't mind, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your, your story as far as what got you started? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a long story, so I don't know how many hours we have. <laughs> I, uh, I've always loved fitness. Um, I played sports in high school and then stopped playing sports in college and gained my freshman 15 a couple times. Um, and then ever since then been struggling with weight. And then I combined that with my experience dealing with um, big four accounting firms and not really liking the way they treat people. So I created my own tax firm, um, but we do the full gamut of things, bookkeeping, all that stuff. And uh, I read this book written by Mike McCallum. It's called The Pumpkin Plan. And it's a book that focuses on like specializing in a certain niche or niche, depending on how people want to say it. Uh, and he uses the analogy of these farmers who grow these gigantic prize winning pumpkins. It's like, how are these guys growing thousand pound pumpkins? What are they doing? And he found that the same system they use is the same system a business can use. So I went through his steps. If you've ever read any Mike McAllister's books, which I recommend to any of your listeners, his stuff is phenomenal and very actionable. He lays out the steps, like, how do you identify a niche or a niche? Um, and I did it and I'm like, wow, we have a good handful of gym clients, fitness professionals, and we really like working with them. They actually, they are the type of personality that knows they need help and they're willing to follow our cues. And I think that comes from their experience as being coaches and asking their clients and members to follow their cues. So just, it worked out really well. And from there, we decided to start focusing our marketing on helping fitness professionals. And then uh, in addition to that, with Profit First, Mike Michalowicz has another book called Profit First, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about today. But uh, that led into the opportunity to write a book specifically about cash flow for gym owners. And uh, during that whole time, it's one thing for an accountant to be able to look at your financials on paper. And we can see things. Uh, we certainly were able to see things like, hey, looks like you need some more revenue streams. Looks like your expenses are bloated, things like that. But I felt like I was still missing a piece. So I decided to buy into a gym as a owner. So I'm a 50% owner and I have another business partner there. Literally just so that I could understand our fitness professional clients better. And it has been eye-opening because seeing something on paper now, I have the emotional baggage sometimes that comes with decisions. Like it was easy for us to tell a gym owner, you know, you really ought to consider adding another, another revenue stream because our gym clients who are really successful have at least two or three solid revenue streams and you have one. Now I know that when we, when we tried to do that in our gym, we got a crap load of pushback from our coaches. So now we can now advise them like, look, this is really important. Data shows it will help you be more profitable. Just know you're changing things and your team might not want to change with you. So it's really given us a whole other element of insight into helping fitness professionals stay in business. Um, and I'm sure I'll get into that a little bit later as well, but I, I'm really passionate about what fitness professionals give back to the world. And so I want them to stay in business. And that's kind of why we do what we do. Oh, that's, that's incredible. And, and that experience that you had uh, building that, that gym was, was also part of the inspiration I imagine for, for writing the book profit first for, for micro gyms. And now you're, you're taking what you've learned and using that as a platform in order to be able to help gyms to be able to, to get in a better position so that they can have better cash flow management. How did you actually decide to, to write a book on, on cash flow management in general, though, what a what a cool plate direction to go. Um, well, so I'm in the organization with Mike Bacalowitz, Profit First Professionals, and he kind of hinted in one of um, a gathering of professionals. He's like, "Hey, look, 
I think if you are making a lot of changes to the generic system that I created, we should consider the possibility that maybe a book needs to be written for it. And um, I wanted to establish myself as the authority in the space. There are other accountants who work in this area. None of them own a gym though. And none of them have been a profit first professional as long as I have. And none of them have worked with as many gym owners as we have on cash flow. So I'm like, I, I really, I'm not the type of person that wants a lot of spotlight. I mean, it's the one reason my firm is called Insight Tax, not the name, my name or last name, which you often see in accounting firms. So I didn't have that play, but I really felt like I owed it to the fitness industry to take on that challenge of putting myself in the spotlight a little bit and writing the book because I just, I truly believe no one else could give as good of information as I have. And let me tell you, as a non-author, writing a book is a lot harder than it may sound like. I mean, it's, man, just sitting down and writing words, it's, it's way more than that. Uh, you you want to develop, develop the concepts, you got to try them out. You know, I'm an accountant by nature. And so sometimes we communicate in a way that doesn't make sense to normal human beings because <laughs> it just, we use stupid words. And so like to then work through, how do I explain this concept better without using stupid accounting words that, you know, the rest of the world doesn't care to learn about. Uh, it, it was, it was a wild experience, but really worthwhile for us for sure. Oh, that's, that's great. And this is definitely a, an in uh, awesome topic for us to be talking about today. Uh, in one of our last episodes, we spoke to Sherry Castelli uh, from ClassPass. And one of the things that she mentioned was that finan financial data is one of the most in important areas for a business to get immediately in, in control so that they can be best positioned for growth. And so I feel like it was faith that we had the opportunity in order to be able to, to speak today, John. And so I know that there's a lot of implications that, that exist, you know, kind of standing in the way of gyms being able to uh, be able to control their finances. Uh, it's kind of a, a black box for a lot of people in terms of, you know, where to start uh, and, and what are the problems in that. From your perspective, what do you see as the greatest challenge that a business owner faces concerning their finances? The number one problem we see is gym owners are so willing to what I call fall on the sword and sacrifice their own self um, for the sake of keeping the gym uh, with cash flow and paying their team members and keeping the doors open. So usually that looks like, oh, I can't really afford to pay for this class. I'm going to go ahead and jump in and I'm, not, I'm actually going to, I'm not going to pay myself to do that. I'll, I'll wait till everything else is paid and hopefully there's some scraps left over for me to take. Um, and that mindset happens a lot because there's the charitable nature to the service of being a fitness professional and which is awesome and it's true, but we have to have business, so gym owners understand that they're a business owner and they have to understand that they need profit they need cash left over after paying expenses or all that passion they have to save humanity through better health will eventually not be enough to overcome the burnout they feel because they realize I'm working crazy long hour days and I have nothing to show for it. I can barely keep food on my table. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we really like the profit first system. Uh, but yeah, I think that's the number one thing. It's this mindset that, well, I'm helping people. And I mean, I know I need to get paid for it, but should I be paid what I'm worth? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm saving their lives, which they are. So I, I think that's what happens. And you can still have that passion. I say I'm saving their lives and you can be profitable. It's not one or the other. We have clients, lots of clients. They can do both. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's they're they're not mutually exclusive. I want I have like two questions to kind of I guess go into that a little bit further. I guess when is the point where I guess maybe there's a red flag that says okay uh, we have cash flow management problems. Is there like a specific metric or maybe if someone's listening to this right now, uh, whatever you're about to say, is it a red is there a red flag that they can listen to to know if they should be reaching out to someone like like you? Um, I think. 
there's probably multiple red flags, but anytime you have to pay a bill and you're like, where the crap am I going to come up with that money to pay that? You have a problem. I, I like the way of putting that. And I, I'm wondering also too, from your perspective, John, is uh, you've obviously, I, I've worked with, with plenty of gyms and studios, et cetera, with my role, Kalen as well, but I've never really discuss their financial cash flow to the extent that you have with individuals. Do you think that some gym owners, is there like an issue where they don't want to seek help externally, maybe because of a pride factor or maybe like a security factor as well? You know, they want to try to do everything themselves because it's their business. Uh, Yes. And I mean, we all have egos. I do feel like it's more of an ego play. I've been able to interact with gym owners on a variety of things. By the time they come to us as an accounting firm, they've overcome that objection and they're willing to talk to us. But I see gym owners interact with each other with other gym owners, whether that's on uh, social media forums or at conferences and things like that. And knowing some of their actual numbers and seeing how they present themselves to others, uh, there's definitely, I'm thinking to myself, I'm seeing two gym owners talk and they're both from the surface. You'd be like, Oh, these guys are doing great. I'm like, I know both their numbers and neither one of them are doing good. And they could probably help each other if they were willing to open up and be vulnerable. Uh, but yeah, they're not a lot of times they're not, I'm not saying it's, I mean, they can get over it at some point they'll need to, because it's the same reason like members come to you as a gym owner because they don't know how to hit their goals anymore. They don't know how to lose the weight. They don't know how to improve their performance. You're there to help them do that. Um, So unless they're planning on putting in the years of study, like to learn all that stuff themselves, it's probably more efficient for them to leverage their time and use a professional who's done it before. Yeah, excellent. I mean, there, there's no shame in not knowing something that you haven't dedicated your your life to, to learning. Um, yeah, I think you bring in a really cool perspective in the fact that you bring not only your your expertise from Big Four Accounting, but you're also your passion and actually decided to open up a, a physical center. Um, did I understand correctly, if if a gym owner is one of these people who may be reluctant to, to seek out some kind of professional advice from an accounting firm, that, that you would recommend at least they try to, to build a network uh, of other gym owners, someone that they can trust to as kind of like a, a first level of conversation as a gateway to, to get to these more professional conversations? Yeah, I, there's two elements, I think. And one, like, obviously, I wrote a book, so it's a shameless plug. But reading a book is a very inexpensive way where you don't have to engage with an actual professional and you might grab a few golden nuggets that even if you implement a few of them, your business is going to see an upward projection. But I do feel like in the gym industry, I mean, this is across the board with all of our clients who not even non-gym owners, when you're the owner, you are on an island and I get it. Like you can't talk to your team about all the stresses you have because they're not going to understand it. Half of them think that you're filthy rich just because you're the owner. They, they do the math and say, oh, you have X amount of members and they're paying this much. Wow, you're raking it in. They totally forget that, you know, you're paying 50% or something to this expense over here. I mean, at the end of the day, you have like $2 left. Uh, they, they don't know that. So you can't talk to them. So having someone, a network of either other gym owners who maybe aren't geographically in the same area, or maybe they are. I've seen a lot of great collaborations between owners. And for the clients we work with, they, I mean, 100 to 300 members, like they don't, for sure, they don't need more than 300 members if they really, I mean, to be profitable. And um, I work a lot with this company called Two Brain, and they have some metrics that show that, yeah, 150 members is a real nice sweet spot for high profitability and good take-home pay if you have your business set up the right way. So it's like, you can collaborate, but there's so much value in talking to someone else who's dealing with the same problems you're dealing with or finding a mentor who's already done it. Um, I, I say it that way because I'm in the industry. I see the space. There are mentors in the fitness professional space who literally have no actual track record. And so make sure you do your homework when you are, if you are going to put that trust in a mentor, 
that you know that they've actually done it before. Um, but yeah, other than that, um, I, I think having a network is super, super valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe this is a, a great uh, transition into, you know, going from you know, some of the implications of being an owner and, you know, the red flags and mistakes that you've seen into, you know, a high level overview of, of cash flow management and the u- unique uh, model that, that you use as well. Maybe to kind of start, you know, what's profit first and how is this different from a traditional uh, way of, of accounting? Yeah, profit first leverages our human behaviors where most forms of budgeting or cash flow management try to force the owner into the mindset of being an accountant. And that's just not gonna work. I don't coach any classes at my gym because I don't have the skill set to do it. I'm probably not patient enough. I certainly haven't done all the education to tell them all their muscle groups and what's working and hinging in the right spots, all that stuff kind of the same with accounting. So that, that's mainly the, the main reason why other systems haven't worked. Um, let me let me explain this thing called Parkinson's law and that'll get me into identifying how this cash flow system helps us because if you've never heard of it before or if you have heard of it before, you are like, this is affecting your life whether you know it or not. So, I was a controller for a door-to-door sales company. And that really just means head accountant. So it's kind of a boring job um, in the way most people look at it. I love numbers. It wasn't boring for me, but I get it. So I'm having this boring job as a head accountant for this door-to-door sales company. And the president of the company comes running into my office and he's completely out of breath. He's like, dude, John, you got to lock the doors. Don't let anyone know that you're here. I'm like, Okay. I feel like you're being a bit dramatic. I mean, you do know what we do in this department, right? I'm like, what gives? Because literally the weekend before we had had this end of year celebration party where we celebrated as a company doing almost $30 million in revenue. And we were handing out bonus checks to sales reps, $10,000, $20,000, $30,000. Well, he's telling me, yeah, all those checks we just gave out at that party, um, they're bouncing. And if you, if they come in, which they're planning on doing, and you give them another check, those are going to bounce too. You see the owner of the company had been working on getting a million dollar loan and he didn't secure it. And so right now, if you're listening to the story, you should be asking yourself, how in the world does a company that does almost $30 million in revenue even need another million dollars to cover paying their team. Well, um, I'll shed some light on that. So six months earlier, I'm sitting in this executive meeting with the the president, vice president, recruiting people. I'm like, hey guys, let me introduce you to this really super sexy spreadsheet. And on this spreadsheet, I laid out for them that every sale that we did as a company, we kept $8, which is a 1% margin. So that's part of the problem. $30 million in revenue with a 1% like net income margin, not sustainable. And I said, there's this like crazy new innovative idea sweeping the business community. And I think if we implement it here at this company, it's gonna make things better. They're calling it a budget. And they told me, they said, John, you are so paranoid. We don't need a budget, we'll just sell more. So the company imploded, like it ended up declaring bankruptcy, $30 million in revenue. So what was going on is what we call Parkinson's law. Parkinson's law says the demand for something expands to match the supply. So what does that mean in terms of what I'm talking about? The expenses, the amount of money that we are spending expanded to match the cash available to spend. So think about the way most business owners run their finances. They have one business bank account, maybe two, a savings account, but they don't actually pay attention to that. They're running everything out of this one bank account. Well, that's your gigantic pile of supply. And guess what? When you look at your bank account and you see the balance, 
you're making decisions on the balance that's in that account and you're not realizing that that money is committed to other things already. You have a landlord you need to pay. You have team members if you have team members. If you know, you're in the US, you're gonna pay Uncle Sam some taxes. Uh, you should have an obligation to pay yourself. But I just see this balance there. It's like, oh, I can make some money and I'll, I'll, I'll make some decisions to spend that money. So Profit First says, all right, we're not gonna deny this human psychology of Parkinson's law. And instead we're gonna put boundaries around our cash so that we use it as an advantage instead of letting it hinder us the way it hinders most business owners. So the way Profit First works is we say, let's identify the major commitments that we have and let's create a separate bank account for them. So uh, here are the five recommended, well, if you're a fitness professional, we recommend seven accounts. I call them the essential seven. An income account. So that account purely receives deposits from your members. That's its sole purpose. And it'll make sense in a second as I talk to you about how the system flows. So we have an income account. You have a team members. So we have a team member account. And for fitness professionals, this is one of your two largest expenses. Then we have owner's pay. And this one's really important because this helps gym owners avoid burnout because they're going to identify what they should be paying themselves on a market rate. And they're actually going to do it. That's what that account is. We're going to commit it ahead of time. We're going to pull it out of the account so that we know that we're not going to spend it. Okay. So income team member owners pay, then a profit account. The profit account is to reward the owner for the risk they're taking in being the owner. Your other team members are not taking this risk. Therefore they deserve no reward for that. You might have another business partner who doesn't work in the day-to-day -day of the business. That business partner is not going to get paid out of owner's pay because they're not working in the business, but they are taking a risk of being an owner. And that's what the profit account is for. It's just like if I buy Walmart stock, you know, maybe I'm going to get some dividends off of it, but I, I took a risk and therefore I, there should be some upside. So the profit account is for distributions to owners of profit distributions. Uh, then we have your uh, tax account. It is so much easier to set aside your tax burden on a weekly or every other week basis than it is to wait till April and be like, I owe $3,000, $5,000, $10,000 in taxes. Where the crap is that money? That, that can't be right. It is right. You just spent it because of Parkinson's law. So let's set it aside in a separate bank account. Then we have operating expenses. Um, that's the one that we're already all familiar with. That's the one we're using. That's where you pay all your bills out of. And then we like to have an equipment account. If you have an actual physical location, or even if you're driving to people's locations, but you're using your equipment, there's wear and tear on that. And at some point you're gonna have to replace it. So let's set aside a small amount now and plan ahead so that when the rower breaks down, or I need to buy a new barbell or the weight plates, the hubs on the weight plates get destroyed. I can replace it and I don't have to like scramble around to find the money. So we have all those accounts and that's really what makes up the system. The actual application of the system comes when we then say, okay, you have these accounts set up, what do you do with them? We recommend no more than once a week, but at least twice a month. Um, that you sit down and look at your numbers. And on those days, we call them allocation days because you're gonna allocate money from your income account into all these other separate accounts. You're gonna zero out your income account. You're just gonna bloop, 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 pop it into these other accounts. And so by doing that, now let's say overall, I have $15,000 in the bank. Maybe I only have 7,000 sitting in my operating expense account. So I've said to Parkinson's law, I said, I get you, I see you, but I see the 7,000 on my operating expense account. The other seven safely tucked away with other purposes. So I'm going to make decisions on how to run this business on the 7,000 instead of seeing the full 15, which we know now half of it's been committed to other things anyways. Um, and that, 
I mean, that's the bread and butter of the system. There, there's obviously some intricacies uh, to all of it, but there's your general overview, Caitlin, and, and it's really worked really well. The one thing that I love about, well, I shouldn't say it that way. The silver lining to COVID pandemic is that all of our gym owner clients who had a habit of running the Profit First system are still in business. And while it's stressful, they've never been stressed out about cash during this time period um, because every fitness professional at some point probably had to be shut down, especially if you had, definitely if you had an actual location. Um, and so like all of our clients, they took massive hits last March and April, and then they're slowly building back up. Not all the clients, like a lot of gyms have gone out of business. And so this, why it's never, nothing's ever a guarantee, man, the track record says profit first helps to get through crisis. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. There's a lot of good stuff, good stuff in there in order to, to jump into. I, I'd say, you know, kind of kicking it off with, with uh, the Parkinson's law that you were talking about. I, it was the first time I've actually heard it listening to you. And, you know, you know my mind jumped to, to actually where your how team spends hours as well. You also see it there. You give somebody a task and give them a deadline. That task always takes to the deadline that you give. And exactly. in some cases, even longer. So it, it's a super interesting <laughs> law that kind of uh, that governs uh, work and, and so much more. The, 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 the thing that I'm I'm curious about is this this model makes a lot of uh, makes a lot of sense in um, I imagine that and correct me if I'm wrong that a a gym owner may struggle with this and be a little bit hesitant to jump in I can just see a gym owner saying something along the lines of how can I stay competitive when I'm working on less and my competition is spending more the customer has certain expectations does yeah. that does that come up or no, totally. And I, I think that's, an, we just often want to compare ourselves to our competitors. And based on what I've seen, I, I don't, I don't think you should compare yourself to your competitors. I think you should compare yourself to what the data says that we know works for fitness professionals, size of gyms, all that stuff. Um, I, I mean, even when it comes to pricing, like how many gym owners created what they charge for their services purely based on what the gyms around them are charging. Well, I mean, those gyms aren't profitable. <laughs> and so are you really going to base that? That's your, the mechanics of why you created your service. So um, for sure, like, look, gym owners generally aren't passionate about this part of their business. A lot of them want to be the ostrich and stick their head in the sand about it. But if you want any chance of success to have a legacy as a company and to be around as long as you desire to be around, uh, you're going to need profit. Profit isn't about getting rich. It can certainly lead to that, but that's not what it's always about. Profit is the necessary fuel for your gym's healthy survival. Without it, you will eventually reach burnout and close your doors. And so I, it's the same, whatever encouragement they give to their members who maybe walk in and be like, I can't do that today or the members who are paying but aren't showing up. And so you're trying to motivate them to come in. Whatever motivation you're trying to give them, try to self-talk yourself into the same motivation. Um, Cause yeah, it's new, it's a change and it's gonna be a new habit. But the way the system works, it's not that big of a commitment. That's, so the reason we recommend either once a week or no more than twice a month is because the traditional way gym owners currently do their accounting is, oh crap, I have to file a tax return. I'll get my numbers in. And now they're looking at 12 months of numbers. They're trying to you know, get the stuff to their tax preparer. And that's all there is to it. When we sit down in our allocation days, not only am I putting money from the income account into all these separate buckets, I'm also going to look at the transactions that happened during the last time that I sat down. So if I'm sitting down every Friday, I'm just looking at seven days of transactions and they're really recent. So now when I look at my transactions, I can say to myself, which of these expenses are actually helping my business grow, which are actual investments and which ones are not productive expenses. So my book, I call, call them productive or not productive expenses. And I, in uh, in one of my chapters, I go through like, here's ways to analyze. 
so that you know you're getting the right answer. You get in the habit and now all of a sudden, yeah, 15 to 30 minutes a week, that's all it takes. And you don't have to think about your money or situations or bills outside of that time you sit down. So it actually frees up a lot of subconscious mental space that gym owners are currently taking with the worry and concern they normally have with, how, I'm gonna, how am I gonna make payroll? How am I gonna pay the landlord? Crap, taxes are coming up. I hope I don't owe anything. Uh, those types of things, like it, it really simplifies life. Got you. And uh, you've answered several, several questions that I was going to ask you along the way. So um, some ones that, that come out of some of the, the content that you've been sharing, obviously you have a pretty strong stance on profit versus revenue. Profit is a better indicator. Uh, knowing that, while we wish we had kind of some kind of unlimited income uh, of dollar bills, when you're looking at where to, to put that profit, taking into consideration uh, the different counts, accounts you have for yourself, uh, you've already, already taken into consideration the expenses. When deciding which areas to, to spend that dollar in, is that where it comes back to these different ratios that you've calculated about what's the best bang for your buck? Yeah, so... Um... When, when it comes to the profit first system, one of the first things that people need to do is uh, a, a cash flow assessment or cash flow analysis. That analysis is going to tell you where is the current health of your business. And it analyzes what you currently did to these new buckets. Because even if you haven't had separate accounts, you are paying yourself something. Um, you do have operating expenses. You have, have paid team members. So we can figure out look, you haven't set it aside this way, but this is what you did do based on these things. And then we can show them, all right, here's maybe where super fit looks like, but you're right here. Like, you know, 400 pound guy, you're not going to say, Hey, let's go do like, if you're a CrossFitter, you know, are you familiar with the Murph workout? You're not going to have that guy do Murph. Okay. You're going to say, let's do a couple, like, let's sit down on a chair and stand up and do some of those reps. So it's the same idea. We want to get you here, but what's a good first step? That gives us a percentage of what they need to be putting in these separate buckets. Um, in my book, I actually analyzed financially fit gyms. So I tell them based on the revenue size of your gym, here are what financially fit gyms were able to allocate to these different accounts. So that's the gold star that we're shooting for. Um, and then once you have that, so most of the accounts are really for the benefit of the owner owners pay, profit, and tax, those all give the gym owner a pay raise basically. Because right now, whatever money they take home, they're probably having to pay income tax out of that money they took home. We're, we're saying, hell no. The money you take home, let's live off of that. That's your living expense. The gym is the one generating the tax burden. Let's have them save the money. And then of course the profit distributions on top of it to reward them for the, the risk. So those ones, those percentages are pretty straightforward. Uh, the team member expense and the operating expense accounts, that's really where we want the gym owner to be honest with themselves and say, well, the ratio may be 40% or 35% for this, but how do I get that lower? Like maybe there are expenses that really aren't driving the needle for my business. Maybe we aren't pushing forward with these and it was just, it sounded cool. And now I realize I'm not getting any value out of that. Well, let's cut it back. Um, and so then by doing that process and especially doing it once a week, you stay on top of that and you can identify the bad expenses a lot quicker. And so that's the way we look at the ratios and what they should be doing with the money. It, it's just really simple and straightforward. Just follow the system, follow the percentages and, and it really does work out. Got you. Hey, John, not sure if you know you did this, but at the beginning of our conversation, you gave a little bit of a, a little bit of a, an indication that you were going to give some juicy information. And you were talking about successful companies you have worked with. They generally focus on at least these two to three cash flows. Could you maybe talk to, talk to yes. us about what are those two to three or do they sometimes vary between what those two and three are, but what's that recipe for success that you alluded to? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, 
we certainly have seen gyms find success with maybe two of these three, but in general, group training, personal training, and nutrition for a fitness business, um, those three revenue streams, every client we have that has a, like that each one can represent anywhere from 20 to 30% of their total revenue. And it works out really well because then if something does happen to their group class or they lose a personal trainer, like they still have a good set of revenue. But if lots of gyms are either like pure group training um, or pure personal training, or they just do nutrition. And if something happens to that, like they just have to keep on recreating the wheel. Um, now that being said, I know of a gym owner who does, he calls them semi-private classes. So no more than three members per class. That's all he does. He does very well, but his, he, his identifying success is that he charges what he's worth and the people who use him value that. So he didn't base his numbers purely off of, well, what's the guy down the road doing? Uh, I'm just going to charge that. No, he said, look, this is the only thing I'm going to do. I believe in it. It's going to be my sole niche. And this is how much money I want to make. These are my expenses. What do I need to charge? And based on that, he then created his service around what he needed to charge. Um, so there are people out there, but in general, if, you know, Group training, personal training, nutrition, those three are solid, really solid. Excellent. And, and do you see when you're, you're first speaking to someone who is, who is coming to, to have the services of your accounting firm that they'll mention that they have these multiple cash flows, but then when you look at it, I don't know, maybe personal training is, you know, 1% or something super small of the revenue. And based upon that, do you then advise them that in order for us to basically count on that as a cash flow that is going to be um, bringing us in significant revenue and being able to consider it for financial purposes? Is that kind of like that 20 to 30% uh, of revenue that you were mentioning? Yeah, we definitely see all that stuff. Um... <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, group training, personal training, nutrition, and like group training is 98% of the revenue. Um, we've also seen even more extreme. It's like, oh yeah, but we, I mean, we have a kid's class. We have Olympic lifting class. We do these specialty things. We sell inventory. We, we have apparel sales. We sell supplements and you look at it and you're like, okay, so you're spending all of these hours to generate 2% of your revenue. Um, maybe if we focus on growing one of them at a time, we can grow that one thing a lot more efficiently than trying to grow five things at the same time. Um, but yeah, one thing we found was the beauty of personal training. And there's a lot of data out there that supports this. And there's some people, some mentors who design their entire mentoring over this concept. You, the data tends to show that if you bring a new member on under personal training, and you can get a certain amount of personal training sessions with them up front before they consider jumping to group training, or maybe it's a hybrid thing. The personal training is really sticky. And so your retention of that client is so much better than the gyms who are just jumping people straight into group training and not doing a level of personal training. There becomes less of a connection that they tend to have with the coach compared to the personal training level. And so um, a lot of mentors are saying, hey, let's start with personal training, get them in the door that way. It is a higher, uh, usually it's a higher profitable service anyways, uh, because it's more one-on-one -on -one and you're charging a lot more for that compared to the group training. Uh, anyway, so we, we've seen things like that as well. Awesome. Super cool. And, and, and I'm, I'm curious as far as looking at some of the 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 metrics in that as far as how you advise you know the the gym owners in order, in order to look at it what what do you recommend is kind of the best ways in order to to look at the metrics is it uh profit in relation to revenue profit per member how, how, what's kind of a good benchmark for a gym to know like hey, i'm doing pretty good or i need some work yeah um the most important one is what are they taking home is it enough for them to not get yeah. burned out um, and does that take home pay continue to increase? We do liken that income 
Um, but net income of itself isn't really a good measure because it's the consequence of how you've decided to manage your cash. Um, we really like average revenue per member. Uh, we think that should be tracked and you want to see that number going up like that. As you add other services, you will see that, or if people jump on and buy, you know, 18 personal training sessions up front or 12, and then move into group training, like your average revenue on that member is way higher than the guy who just comes in for the group class. We also like length of engagement. How long has the member been with you? Or I'm sorry, how long have your members been with you? Um, because there is a cost to bringing on a new member. There's, and there's not even the, just the physical cost of like, whether that's advertising, whatever you're doing to get them into the door to sell them, the time of the person who's actually selling them if you're paying commissions, there's the actual that cost. But there's also this non-financial cost of getting a new member to be acclimated to your current culture with the current members. If you have another guy leave and maybe people like that guy and you bring someone else in and that person ends up not being super personable or have a high level of emotional intelligence, like, you know, there's a cost there. So the longer current members can stay with you, the better. Um, and you always want to see that go up because that is going to tell you how well your services are meeting the expectations of your members. Um, those two are really, really good metrics to track. Um, you could break down revenue per square footage just to see how efficient you're using your space. But again, that is, um, that's more of a consequence of decisions you've made than it is like something that can lead me to, to make changes that I know will end up changing the revenue and changing how much I take home. But they're actual metrics that tell you like how great is this specific class maybe. Um, that's another one. We did this when I first joined because we had some trouble with some of our coaches that were super entitled. And like one was like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. You didn't know which, which guy was gonna show up Oh, is it happy Chad or really pissed off Chad? Is it good? The Chad is going to drop F-bombs at our members or the one who's going to be encouraging. Um, we, we started looking at profitability and attendance per class. And it's a little bit more involved to calculate. So I don't recommend doing this all the time. But if you're in a scenario where you don't feel like you're making a lot of money or you're concerned about some of your coaches, it's worth the effort. We found that like, the classes that he was coaching, when someone else coached that class, the attendance was way higher. Mm. And that was a trend we saw across the board with all the classes he was teaching. So it's like, okay. So like if it's Tuesday, six o'clock PM slot, when Chad coached it, we may have had two members there. When um, Kelly coaches it, we have eight members there. And so our members were basically telling us, yeah, we're kind of picking and choosing our way around Chad. Uh, and so um, you have, like, it's a good thing to look at if, if you're struggling with your coaches, but that's another metric that I like. Awesome. From the way that it sounds, Chad is gone. <laughs> Chad is gone. And his girlfriend trolled me and was very mad about it and had some fun things to say on social media. It was great. I'm sure it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. So maybe, maybe, maybe moving into you know COVID. I, I know you had a chance in order to to bring up some of the some of the circumstances that happened around uh, around COVID. And one of the things that you mentioned is that you know during during COVID, the facilities that you worked with who were implementing Profit First had problems, but cash flow wasn't uh, wasn't the things that they they had to worry about. I'm curious about how you in interpret this this quote and how you think it applies to to our industry. And the the quote is, "Never let a good cri crisis go to waste." Yeah, um, I think if anything, hopefully those who maybe weren't using a system and metaphorically had were caught with their pants down. Um, you know, let's put something in place now. There's no time like the present to prepare for whatever the next crisis is gonna be. Because while it may not be COVID, there will be something, there's always something. 
Um, so I think as far as like letting, like, let's not let this go to waste. One, did I, was cash tight? Was I really close to going out of business? Um, and like, were there expenses? Cause this is what we do with all of our clients. Uh, you know, we emphasized your model is going to look very different for the next couple of months as you're forced to close down. There's probably some expenses you can cut that maybe made sense when you could have people physically in your gym. And so the idea of identifying, consistently identifying, are these expenses actually working for me? This is one of the reasons why Profit First works because without it, as our income increases, usually our expenses increase at the same rate, if not faster than our income. But we don't think about it because revenue's coming in, it's flowing good. Hey, I signed up for this marketing thing. Oh man, I did an additional $25,000 of new revenue this month. Cool. Wait, how did I, I, I spent that additional 25 already? What the heck did I spend that on? Profit First for, forces us to be creative with the money left over. And so you always have this like, you've given yourself this fake reality that you're gonna live within so that you don't add unnecessary expenses as you go and you stay lean. And so as the business grows, your take home grows, your profit grows. If you wanna open up another location, the chance and of financial ability to open that second location increases as you follow the system because you're staying lean the whole time and you keep out all the garbage stuff. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I, I, I took away from what, what, you were, what you were saying is that the, the numbers within the, the model for many of your clients got tweaked a bit during, during COVID and it sounds like they were, they were reduced even, even further. So it sounds like the, the model got supercharged uh, in a way. Um, do you think that um, with kind of the shifts within their, that those those numbers and kind of the industry overall that you see any downstream challenges or opportunities? Um, you know, I think we've all seen the opportunity to add some sort of virtual element to what we're doing. Um, our clients, I think, also found the value in one-on-one -on -one face to face communication instead of some of a lot of these automated tools. I mean, that's one of the benefits of having a micro gym is that you don't have 4,000 members. And so among, between you and your coaches, you could probably get a touch point with your members once a week just to check in because you only have to follow up with 100 to 200 people. And if you have five on your team, like, I mean, that's, hey, we, here's 20 people we want you to text every week. Just send them a text. How's it going? Thinking of you. But it's inner, like, so I think, I feel like that has been highlighted as something that we can take out of this um, and it provides a better customer experience as well. And look, you're serving them, but on the flip side, when you take that type of approach, it also increases your chance to provide additional services to them because you now have a relationship. You're going to find out when other things aren't working for them. And maybe you realize, man, they're a personal training session with XYZ is going to help Bob out really well based on what I've been talking to him about, which you're not going to get if you just send out the automated emails. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's definitely one area. I know some gyms, they love the virtual component so much, they literally have shut down their brick and mortar. Obviously, the margins are better because they don't have a rent expense anymore. And the virtual experience that they've been able to provide is sticky enough that these members want to keep it. Um, and to each their own, right? I don't think that's going to fit for everyone. I think as a, as a market, the market, there's a percentage of that they're still going to want a physical space to go work out with other people. Um, but I think also it, it identified for some people like, you know, I really like enjoy, I enjoy the workout by myself in my house, you following this virtual program and that works for me better. Uh, so I, I think it highlighted some of those things. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Obviously, as a as a technology company, I'm 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 super curious how you kind of see where you see the industry kind of going from here when it comes to um, looking at your your own gym and seeing the increased options from 
you know, a lot of people are talking about Apple's Fitness Plus and in Peloton. How do you see that kind of uh, affecting uh, the the gym model and the studio model? I, you know, it's already been, it's been around. I don't think it'll affect it. Um, I, like I said, I think those who want to go into a class and see people and physically be in the same space with them, they're going to still like that. I have a Peloton treadmill. Um, so I, I see their platform and format and I definitely don't get as much out of the classes as I do. When I'm going into the physical location. because that's just, that's a better environment for me on to work out. I think there's always going to be a play for technology to help gym owners um, improve things. Uh, I mean, we've, I've seen Wattify, I've seen Zen Planner, you know, I've seen these types of CRMs that um, we really need as a gym to manage our database. Uh, and, then, and then there's always these additional technologies that come on because there's not a single software out there that does everything really well. You know, like you have a sugar wad type of thing that tracks workouts really well, but other than that, not that great. Zen Planner is not bad with checking in attendance, but their reports aren't super consistent. I mean, there's, so I can pick like, this is great, this is bad. Um, and so I think there's always gonna be a play for technology to come in and say, here's something we know gym owners need. Let's do it better than anybody else. And maybe someday some big rich person is gonna come in and pull all the awesome companies and just make one thing. So there's one software and they can dominate the market and the government can come in and say, you're a monopoly. That'd be awesome. I'd love to experience that. But for now, right it's, now, gym it owners, sounds, uh, it sounds yeah. like you haven't heard about Virtua Gym, John. <laughs> We're going to need to get you a demo. <laughs> Touche. Yes, yes, of course. And then uh, kind of like going along with, along with that, uh, just going to make a bold statement. You can either stab at it um, and, and knock it down um, or uh, address it how you will. You know, as somebody might say that looking at, you know, the, the increased uh, attention from Fitness Plus with low price points and additionally YouTube that's free, you can make an argument potentially that gyms and studios was, will eventually be competing and racing to the bottom on pricing because consumers will expect lower prices. What do you think about, uh, about that? I think, I think there's always that risk. Um, but I look at it as a risk. Like, first thing that comes to mind, if I think about a retail space and they try to compete with Walmart, Walmart will always beat them to the bottom because they have that ability, they have deeper pockets, they can negotiate harder. Um, it's no different with the gyms. Like if you try to get into the competition to lower your prices uh, and you're racing against the bottom, you literally are doomed. Uh, I just want to give people hope. I know other clients, I have a really great relationship with a business mentor named Chris Thorndike. Um, his company's called Factory Forge. And what he did was he's when COVID happened, he had, um, you know, say 3000 square feet. And he's like, I'm just not as happy at 3000 square feet as I was with 1500 square feet, but I need to make a certain amount of money. So he did the math. He literally shrunk his footprint in half. And he said, based on what I need to do and numbers and all that stuff, this is what I need to charge. And it was like, at least twice as much what his current prices are or were. He's great right now. He's thriving. Yeah. And I would say the members that he has to deal with uh, are a lot more pleasant to deal with than maybe the people who are attracted to this idea of, I just want the lower price. Um, and yeah. so there is always going to be a market for people, for gym owners to charge what they're worth. You don't need a lot of them to make a great living you just, you don't. And so find, they're out there. Those people are out there. People that value your expertise and are willing to pay for it versus just that guy who's always seeming to, well, oh, can you give me a deal? It, can I, I can get a little bit cheaper down the road. All right, go down the road. Yeah. Super well said. And, and John, we got a, a couple uh, other questions that we, we ask all of the panelists who join just a way of being able to uh, help spread some some good uh, good advice out there. Um, the first question is, what is the best advice that 
you've ever received? And then the flip side on that one is what's the best advice that you think you've ever given? Huh. Well, I will say I'm one of those guys where I hate picking one over the other because then it makes the other guys feel like they're not as good. Um, so I, I've, I've been fortunate to receive a lot of great advice. For me, the one that comes to mind right now, I'm working with a um, business mentor. Her name's Kelly Roach, and she has a, an amazing program um, for entrepreneurs. Um, I'm in her higher level master group called Legacy Leaders. And this idea of where do I want to go and not stopping there. Like, what's my vision? What's my current vision of where I want to go? What does your company actually look like when you hit that goal? So right now, that goal for me is a $10 million accounting firm. What does my company look like at that size? And create an org chart. So I have an organizational chart of what the future of our company can look like. And then I create job descriptions for each position. And then I reverse engineer to, okay, this is where I want to go. This is where I'm currently at. Now I have a much clearer vision of when do I need to add people? What positions do I need to add? What are the jobs going to look like? And so I've been using that for the last year and a half now. And it has totally transformed the way we operate as a company because in the past, we've been really good about growing. We do good work and we're adding nice increments every year, but we're doing it under an old system. And the reality is for us, the systems that are going to exist at the size of a $10 million company have to be different than what they currently are. So let's go ahead and change those now to make it easier. Now, some fitness professionals might be totally happy and content with I just want the one location. I want it to be profitable. I want to take vacation when I want to take it. And that's awesome. But at least what does that company look like for you? How many members are you dealing with? And based on how many members you want to have at that size, that's your ideal size, what are your likely expenses on that? Which means, and then what do you want to take home? That can tell you what your prices need to get to. And maybe if you realize, well, I'm going to have to charge a lot more than I'm currently charging. What more can you do in your current service offering to get there? And that for a lot of people can give them enough motivation. I'm going to make that change right now. You know, maybe I'm not going to maybe like tell all my current members, Hey, we're changing to this. Hopefully you're on board with us. Maybe you keep them. And then when you add new members, you add the new members at what the new service looks like so that then you have a cushion and a little bit of protection on revenue. So you can then go back to the other members and say, Hey, we've been doing this with new members at this level, this way, for this amount of time. And uh, now we need you to either jump on board or we're not the right fit for you anymore. Yeah, that's a super powerful way in order to be able to you know, plan out five, 10 years ahead. Um, I'm sure you can even uh, maybe even take the exercise even further and say, what, what skills do I personally need to learn and, and develop in order to be the leader of an organization of that size? And there's a lot yeah. of personal growth in that as well. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, that, that's, that one's awesome. How, how about best advice you've ever given? <laughs> yeah, that one's hard. I'm not sure I've ever given great advice. Um, I put a lot of heart and soul into the book. And so if someone is struggling with cash flow management, I, I, I think my book gives pretty solid advice. Um, so that, that, that's probably what I'd say on that one. Nice. That's a, that's a perfect segue actually. Cause the last perfect. question that I had for you is, <laughs> and I got to get two books from you. Cause the, cause I know you gotta, you gotta put your book in there book. You recommend the others. So that one, of course, but how about a, another book that you would recommend to others that has personally helped you? Um, oh man, there's so many, like, honestly, anything Mike McCallowitz is awesome. His latest book called fix this next, um, basically gives you a tool where you can identify the different areas of your business and which area needs to have your focus because it's like business growth is kind of based on a pyramid. And if you don't have the foundation set up, it doesn't make any sense to work on some of the stuff higher up on the pyramid. And so he has this framework there, but I also would throw in um, the founder of a company called two brain business. His name's Chris Cooper. And he wrote a book a couple of years ago called Founder, Farmer, Tinker, Thief. And I think for fitness professionals, it is spot on. 
he breaks up the different cycles of where a micro gym would be. So if you're just a personal trainer, and I want to say just, if you currently want to only do personal training, you're maybe in this stage. And if you want to grow, like what does growth look like? What are the metrics that are important? What are some of the challenges you're going to face in these different stages? Uh, I just think it's a really great way for us as gym owners to isolate the different growth that we could experience if we want it. Uh, so yeah, I would founder farmer tinker thief by Chris Cooper. Awesome. Thanks, John. No, I felt great. Got a second book in the works. <laughs> um, I have a concept, uh, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I have yeah. to like, I have to develop myself as a leader first and get my team. Like right now we're, I'm growing my leadership level. Um, cause it was just basically me and then everyone else. And now we had to add that level of management. And so once they can take some stuff off my plate, maybe I'll write another one. So John, what, what is a, a micro gym and how do I know if, if I'm a micro gym versus a different kind of breed of gym? Yeah. So I look at, there's two models that I see in the fitness industry, like generically. Um, there's the model of like the 24 hour fitnesses where they rent equipment and then you come in and you do your thing. Maybe they have some classes, um, but it's primarily renting equipment and that they charge less. Then you have what I call micro gyms. These are your boutique studios, fitness studios, personal trainers, where the relationship is more one-to-one, -one, more personal, and you charge more because you're providing a little bit more or a lot more accountability than just renting equipment. Um, and so that's why we think of micro gyms, just the model of, yeah, I, I need to have some sort of relationship with them. And because of that, I charge more um, and I need much fewer and much smaller footprint. Got it. Awesome. Sweet. Yeah. I think that's, that's pretty much it. John, like, I, I think this was awesome. Thanks. Thanks again for, for taking the time in order to, to sync up with us. I'll, uh, I think we already have your, your photos in that as well, but we'll be sure to, to follow up with you if there's any other info we need for, for marketing it. And, and we'll share the video with you in that afterwards so that this way you can put it up on your social and that too. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to chat with you guys and share stuff with your audience.